Congressional hearings kicked off today into the deadly September 11th attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi. Law lawmakers are looking to uncover exactly what it is that happened that night, how it got to that point, and how the administration acted in the aftermath. You have the audacity to come here and say, why wasn't the protection of these people provided for? And the answer is because you damn didn't provide it. This is not simply a cover-up of a third-rate burglary. We have four of our diplomatic personnel dead, and it is not a McCarthy-era tactic to demand accountability and demand that the American people are not misinformed about it. What is clear is that this administration, uh, including the president himself, has intentionally misinformed, read that lied, to the American people in the aftermath of this tragedy. Whew, ugly. Four Americans were killed in the attack, including U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens and two members of the CIA. Former CIA Director David Petraeus appears at both hearings tomorrow morning. There were doubts whether his testimony would actually happen given his abrupt resignation, but Petraeus reportedly volunteered to testify, saying it is the right thing to do. The Wall Street Journal today has an interesting look inside Petraeus' final days at the agency, including reports of interagency finger pointing and rising tensions over Benghazi. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Kelly O'Donnell is on the Hill. And Kelly, it's been two months since the attack, and finally, top Intel players are on the Hill. But frustration seemed to really be boiling on over what's going on. Well, that public hearing that you showed some clips from really showed how politically charged this is. That is not where the secret briefings are taking place. That's a separate thing, and it certainly was a show place for the partisan divide over how people look at Benghazi. When you talk to those who are on the intelligence committees in the House and the Senate, there's a bit more of a, of a sober approach to this as far as trying to get to the fact-finding. David Petraeus will be here tomorrow. He did voluntarily come to testify, meaning there's no subpoena involved. Today, they're hearing from the top intelligence folks from the CIA, the FBI, the National Intelligence Office. And they are learning some of the timeline. We are told that they are getting a sense of what was known and why did this whole controversy bubble up about a video, a spontaneous protest, or was it an intentional act of terror, which has been such a part of the political dynamic here. And so what we're hearing from members who were in the earlier briefing, the Senate briefing is happening right, is happening right now, is that there was a difference in the nature of the attacks. The first wave of the attack appeared more chaotic. The second attack, this went on over a period of seven hours, appeared far more co coordinated with command and control, the ability to bring weaponry, things like that, that caused some of this unease about how to decide who was behind it and what was going on. When you talk about frustrations, there are those political frustrations, but also there have been a lot of frustrations here about wanting to get to the bottom of it, to know what happened, why Chris Stevens, the ambassador, uh, his pleas for additional security, his warnings about dangers in the area may not have been addressed properly. They're really trying to look at this uh, to try to put an end to what happened here, to understand it, and to provide for those who are in diplomatic posts in other dangerous parts of the world to make sure this kind of thing cannot happen again. So, uh, Kelly, this is uh, Steve Kornacki. A uh, part of this story then involves the potential nomination of Susan Rice, the U.N. ambassador, to replace Hillary Clinton uh, at the State Department. There's a lot of indications that Obama would like to do that, but it is Susan Rice who a lot of Republicans have just sort of decided, uh, you know, went out there and, and lied to the public. They, they allege um, and was executing some kind of intentional cover-up plot by the administration. I do not know how that would work or what the motive for that would be or what the cover-up would be, but be that as it may, that is what Republicans are saying. My question to you is... You have John McCain and Lindsey Graham both now saying that if her nomination is put forward for state, they will filibuster it. Are there any indications that that would become an official Republican Party position? Because if the, if the Republicans unite, they would have the 40, 40 votes to kill it by filibuster. Well, there is a lot of opposition among Republicans to a potential Susan Rice nomination. People are not actively talking about filibuster, although that's the obvious presumption if you're going to talk about members trying to block something like this. In some ways, they are saying that she was chosen by the White House to be the public face in those early days after this attack. 
to talk about what happened. And they say that if she were to become Secretary of State, she would need sort of a greater sense of recognizing that the story that was being put forward might not be accurate. So they're sort of compelling her to have greater knowledge than what was given to her by the intelligence community. Uh, she has become a political focus here. Whether they actually can go forward with that or not is a matter to be decided later. What it has done very effectively in the moment is to bring much greater focus to Benghazi. And that may be part of the strategy in talking about Susan Rice so publicly, to get the president involved, to have him comment, as we saw at his news conference, to get Democrats certainly wanting to uh, talk about it as well and putting a national spotlight on it. When there's been a lot of frustration here among both parties that the Benghazi story and the incident there has not gotten sufficient attention over time. And so by making Susan Rice such a front and center uh, personality in this, it has attracted more interest and more information and perhaps more action from the administration to provide answers. All right, NBC's Kelly O'Donnell, thanks so much. Good to be with you. And for more on Benghazi, we turn to NBC News terrorism analyst Evan Coleman, senior partner at Flashpoint Global Partners. Evan, thanks so much for being with us. And we heard some of the rancor coming out of the public hearings today. Tomorrow's hearings will be closed. General Petraeus is scheduled to testify. What do you think will be said in those hearings? Uh, unfortunately, I think it's going to be a lot of politics. I mean, part of the problem here is that you have two inquiries going on right now. You've got the, the, the congressional inquiry, which is really a media circus, and you've got a, a, a judicial inquiry, which is going on inside the Department of Justice and the FBI, looking at the people who actually carried out the attack in Benghazi. And I, what I'm concerned at is that all this media circus on Capitol Hill is taking away from what we, we really need to be doing, which is hunting down the people that killed our ambassador, mm -hmm. hunting down those individuals and bringing them to justice, because at the rate we're going right now, the only, the only justice these folks are going to see is maybe at the, the wrong end, the business end of a Hellfire missile. It, it's, it's doubtful if they're ever going to see a court of law. Uh, Evan, uh, if we could turn for a minute to the Middle East, uh, you know, the situation this week is that Israel has basically opened an attack on Gaza because of continuing rocket fire from Gaza into southern Israel. This is sort of an ongoing story. It's been going back years. There was, you know, there was a, a big attack from Israel four years ago. Um, I, I guess my question is this. Um, how much credibility does Netanyahu, who who's sort of ordered this attack, have in saying this is the last and only available recourse for Israel uh, when there really wasn't much of an effort to engage Egypt, for instance, maybe in trying to act as a military? middleman, um, or, you know, there hasn't really been much of a concerted effort on the Netanyahu government's part to build up the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Um, is this really, was this really necessary at this point for Israel to act like this? Look, the Israelis were getting hit by quite a number of rockets, and it's certainly within their, their uh, judgment to, to defend themselves and take actions to defend themselves. There is, however, there are facts here that, that make you wonder whether or not the Israelis may have acted a bit hastily. Uh, namely the fact that in addition to Hamas, there are other actors in the game here. A lot of the people that are firing these rockets at Israel, they're not Hamas. They're Al-Qaeda types. They, they're part of a group calling itself the Mujahideen Shura Council in Beit al-Maqdis. Uh, they don't have anything in common with Hamas. In fact, they consider themselves to be enemies of Hamas. They are firing lots of rockets at Israel, and Israel is blaming those attacks on Hamas because Hamas is the regional power broker. But I don't know if that's really going to progress ourselves forward. These kind of al-Qaeda splinter groups are never going to stop firing rockets. Hamas has no control over them. So if, the, if there's going to be this constant cycle where these groups fire a rocket to become a spoiler, Israel retaliates, and then there's this clash of forces and nothing gets resolved, I, it's hard to see where the progress is there. Yeah, Evan, let's broaden it out a little bit and see where progress could possibly happen or be kept from happening because this week a Hamas commander was killed after an Israeli assault which followed uh, rocket attacks from Hamas. But broader than that, right now we have uh, 30,000 Israel, Israeli reservists called up just today. So that's kind of like Israel saying, every man get your gun and come down here and fight. Uh, but more than that, we have Netanyahu is up for election in January. And we have Morsi, who is just basically still the new uh, head of Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood does not like a Respect Israel at all. So, how do these other pieces, these leaders, new leader and uh, leader facing election soon, factor into the whole situation? Well, Mercy is in a particular vulnerable situation here because, you know, it was one thing when Mubarak was heading Egypt. Uh, he could simply ignore the Arab street. He could ignore the, the protests against Israeli actions in Gaza. Mercy cannot do that. Not only is he a quote-unquote democratically elected leader, but he's also the head of the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and Hamas is, of course, a, a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. So this is a, a very complicating factor. 
And I mean, we should say, though, that I don't think Mercy or anyone else in Egypt is looking to start a war with the Israelis. They're simply going to be, have to be much more cognizant of what's going on and responsive to, again, I think a sentiment among, uh, among the Arab street, which is that the Israeli actions are unjustified. Now, I mean, as, as, far, as far as Netanyahu is concerned and the, the upcoming election, look, I mean, he's playing to a domestic constituency. The problem is, is that every time the Israelis have gone into Gaza, they've done limited damage to Hamas. They've done some limited damage to other factions, but they've done nothing permanent. I mean, we're back in the situation once again, the same situation we've been in time and time again over the past 10 years. And, and it, again, it just doesn't seem, where is the progress? What is being solved here? Mm. Well, Evan, to make matters worse, you know, Israel, uh, as we've discussed, has its plate full for from Egypt and those frayed relations to Gaza and Hamas. Let's add Syria into the mix. Um, Israel fired uh, shells into the Syrian border after receiving some mortar fire it itself in the Golan Heights. Um, it, it really does not have the time or energy to invest in Syria. But if things spiral out of control, there, how much pressure does that also put on Israel to act? I think the Israelis have been pretty clear, and including in just the last few days, that they have absolutely no interest in getting involved in what's going on in Syria. And there is just so many different reasons for that. I mean, first of all, it is an intractable conflict. But beyond that, None of, the, none of the actors involved in Syria right now are pro-Israeli. Every single one is more Israeli than the next. And the, the, the worst thing that they could do right now is get involved in that conflict and give Bashar al-Assad, give the Assad regime some kind of propaganda cover, some kind of political cover saying, we're not just fighting against uh, uh, revolutionaries, we're fighting against Israeli spies, right. we're fighting against the Mossad. So I, I think from Israel's perspective, they've got enough problems right now dealing with Gaza. The last thing that they need is to add to that plate. And there's just what can be gained by getting involved in Syria from the Israelis' perspective. Whoever wins in Syria, Not at good. least from the Israeli perspective, is the enemy. Right. That's right. Yeah. All right. Great analysis. Evan Coleman, thanks so much. Thank you very much.